time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, the opening shot, uh, if you uh, notice, is, um, uh, was a picture of a, a Native American and a baby, and it was sent my way by one of the viewers, and I'd like to thank her for that. Um, and it, there's a little writing on the side. It's very, very old, um, uh, probably older than myself. And it, it calls it the Indian Madonna, and I thought that was really uh, um, an appropriate opening shot today because uh, Tom Stahl and I, we're going to kick some things around. We really have no direction to go in. And so, uh, but I'm sure that somewhere along the line we will have early constitutional issues, and therefore um, the Indian Madonna seemed to be appropriate. Um, I had a lot of calls on the last show that we did. Uh, in reference to the anti-terrorism bill, and uh, instead of answering a lot of questions, it raised some more questions. So in between now our casual conversations here, we'll try to address one or two questions that was um, put to me um, as the show aired. And let's see what else. Um, my health is great, and Tom and I are going to talk about that for a minute too. Thank you for coming, and it's now time to meet um, my friend Niels, Tom Stahl, you got to be a regular here. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Well, um, I'm proud to be known as a friend. Yeah, you are. And, um, and I hope I will be a good friend and uh, to um, everyone out there by helping them with some issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I cannot directly physically help people, but if there's something that I've thought about or found that helps put the puzzle together, for somebody, uh, I hope that helps them, and I hope other people will do that for me. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, they have many times. They have, yeah. You know, and uh, the reason we, you and I make such a good team, I'm a go with the flow type person, and you are the official citation checker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're bringing up uh, uh, Justice uh, Goodloe's Goodloes, um, yeah, so essay. So, so what happens is I just go with the flow and I make it up as I go along, and then you'll say, no, but wait a minute, and then you <laughs> have to make sure it's all correct and, and checked, and that's why. Um, well, yes, that's what I was for Justice Goodlow when he uh -huh. uh, wanted to publish his essay on jury power, jury nullification, empowering the jury as the fourth branch of government. And this is the newest uh, incarnation of Justice Goodlow's mm -hmm. essay, it has a new section in it by Pat uh, Michael. Pat Michael, uh, to, to uh, remind you who she is, she's the young lady that did the jury uh, shows with us. And, um, and if she was here, she would keep both of us in line. <laughs> she sure would. <laughs> so I mean, kind of miss her, she's yeah. more straight-laced even than I am, and I'm a kind of a straight-laced, uh, and I was always a, such a serious child and such a conservative young man. Yeah. Um, Card-carrying Republican yeah, yeah. at one time, if you can believe yeah, that. Hold it up just a little okay. bit. Uh, uh, not that high. Not that high? Okay, well, right, about here. right there. Leave, keep okay. it right there. I'll just yeah. leave it here and I'll get my fingers kind of out of the way. Yeah. It's the latest uh, incarnation because it has a new section mm -hmm. written by Pat Michael on voir dire, which is jury selection. How are juries chosen? And I'm not going to steal her thunder, but I will give like a one-sentence synopsis. Mm -hmm. The way juries are chosen is the judge probes their state of mind with questions to find out how they think, mm -hmm. what they think about. And the phrase, state of mind, probing the state of mind, is actually in the statutes. And how do I know that? Well, I was a checker, <laughs> <laughs> citation yeah. checker on this too. And so we looked up uh, uh, voir dire statutes, and the Washington State voir dire statutes are reprinted in their entirety in this booklet, and, and then excerpts out of others. So that's what they do. They probe the state of mind, and if that state of mind is not to the judge's liking, mm -hmm. and more specifically to the government's liking, then these jurors are taken off the jury. They're challenged for cause. They're called biased because mm -hmm. they don't think right. So they're biased. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, if you oppose a law, uh, then you're biased if you oppose a law. Like, yeah. say, if you oppose this law, the Anti-terrorist. Anti uh, should I hold that up again? Yeah, well, but that's okay. Well, let's, okay. let's put that on hold If you oppose that here. one, you'd be considered biased. Yeah. Uh, but if you supported it, if you said to the judge while he's asking you, do you support this law? Well, yes, I do. I will follow these laws. I support these laws. Then you're unbiased. Mm -hmm. Very strange way of defining biased and unbiased. If yeah. you support the government, you're unbiased. Uh, but if you oppose it, why you're biased? I want to uh, I want to go to light side first. So let's have a little light conversation here. Um, how's the harvest? 
It hasn't started yet. Mm -hmm. I'm a late harvesting person late in my region. I'm a late bloomer. Where I am is on a plateau, uh, fairly high above the Columbia River. Some of my land's at an elevation of 3,000, 3,100, 3,200 mm -hmm. uh, feet. And the nights are cold, so things don't ripen up very quickly. And there's a, a new variety of wheat that we've been growing. By new, it's a few years old. It's called L-tan, and it's just a slow ripening wheat anyway. And so in my region, plus L-tan, it means I will be harvesting probably in August, but quite a bit in September, too. September, yeah. And, and two years ago, I promised you crop circles. Well, it hasn't happened yet. Not yet. So I'm working on it. We're working on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, don't work on it like, like those fellows in England uh, no, claim like to that. the two or three guys say, well, we worked yeah. on it with ropes and boards, and we made yeah. this elaborate thing a mile long in like yeah. 15 minutes, and, and yeah. you know, they're claiming that. They hoaxed it. And, yeah. uh, but I understand, uh, you told me that it, it, when it's quiet time, that you and the neighbors uh, watch the crop circle tapes quite often, still trying to figure out how these blown notes appear. They, so let me get your take on that. Yeah, they've been kind of a hit because um, people who are around the crops and, and have harvested them, watch them being harvested, they can tell when something naturally lays down mm -hmm. and when some unexplained force has laid it down. Mm -hmm. See, and I've seen a lot of wheat that's laid down, mm -hmm. and they all have. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, it's in irregular patterns, sometimes kind of star-shaped. Uh, it usually happens because there'll be like a hard rain and a wind at the same time. And the rain will provide the weight and the wind will provide the direction. Mm -hmm. But then it's going to be basically all one way, Yeah, pretty much all one way. And there'll be skips and misses, but pretty much all one way. And you sure won't have round circles. Yeah. Or if the rain comes straight down, say a real hard rain, and, and this is only at a certain stage of the wheat. I mean, if it's too early, uh, the wheat's too young, it will not lay down from natural forces. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, if, if we've already cut it, it won't. But um, right up until the time we cut it, it can lay down, say in a star shape, if the rain, a heavy rain or hail comes from straight down. But okay. it still won't bundle it. It will not weave it. Yeah. Uh, it will not bend the stalks at the node, the blown yeah. node that Ilias yeah. talks about. Will not do that. I've never seen that. I've seen lots of wheat laid down, yeah. but I've never seen the blown node. And I've never seen bundled, and I've never seen uh, circles or mandel brought fractals or triangles or any of the other very intriguing geometric shapes and yeah. some of the very beautiful artistic shapes. Yeah. Never seen that. Seen a lot of laid down wheat. I've never seen what is classically known as the crop circle. They're cool, huh? Yeah, and of yeah. course I would definitely like to. Yeah, well, like, like, like I said, we, uh, we just, every once in a while we have tried to concentrate on a certain area and they have shown up, so we've all concentrated, but your, your windmills or whatever it is you do there probably interfere with it, and I'm, I'm just, that's not true at all. But anyway, I'm, maybe next year you'll get one. And, well, the windmills aren't there yet. I mean, there's a few old farm windmills, mm -hmm. the old style of the Chicago air motor with uh, multiple fins, many, many little fins, and the wind feeds from one fin to another and keeps it turning. That was a kind of revolutionary design back mm -hmm. in 1880. And uh, there's a few of those, and a couple of them even still running, actually pumping water. But the, the big windmills to generate electricity, they have not yet come. Mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's the Douglas County PUD and a company from California, Sea West um, Wind Power, is looking at the area to see if they could put up large windmills to generate electricity. And by large, I mean the blades on them might be 150 feet in diameter. Oh. The hub of the thing will be 200 feet off the surface of the ground. And um, they, are, they have them up to the size of uh, one and a half uh, megawatts. In other words, uh, you know, 1,500,000 watts of power these That's things could lot. turn, yeah. produce when Actually, they Actually, I can comprehend that. Pretty hard for me, too, when the numbers get mm -hmm. big, you know. Yeah. Pretty hard for me, too. It's, uh, the, I, the idea is, well, here might put it in perspective, you know, I believe Bonneville Power Administration, their total capacity with all their dams is about uh, 9, uh, 9, thousand, uh, I think it's 9,000 megawatts, mm -hmm. and they'd like to get uh, a thousand more mm -hmm. from wind power, and so they would like to see a thousand windmills built in eastern Washington. Mm -hmm. Now that is if the price of electricity stays up. 
Uh, I'll digress here for a moment. There's something that is kind of attractive in the short term, but in the long term it can cause shortages, and that's price controls. Um, there is definitely a place for investigating as to why prices and prices of things like electricity go up astronomically in a short time. If somebody's gouging or stealing, that definitely needs to be investigated. And if it's found that there has been some stealing or gouging in the public, well, the money needs to be taken back from whoever did the gouging and given back to the ratepayers. But if the price rise is from a natural shortage, you know, we just have kept using more and more and didn't yeah. build power generation, then you need to let the price rise because that's the only way you'll encourage more power plants to be built. Yeah. If you want to ensure perpetual shortages, well then you have price controls. You get situations like in some cities where they've had rent control for a long time, there's no place to rent. You know, yeah. terrible housing shortage and you start getting into homeless problems. Well, if you want to have rolling blackouts forever, then just have price controls. President Bush at first was opposed to them, and then I read in the papers that he has uh, recently acceded to the idea that, uh, of price controls. Depending now, on what he puts on, uh, it could kill the generation of new electricity. Yeah, now I, I read a, a European publication here the other day uh, where um, they're trying to shut down most of the nuclear um, re reactors in, in Europe because they defaulted or something like that. Well, anyway. So, but then, but you've been doing other full wonderful things. You, a few weeks ago, you came did a show with us, and um, and um, we covered Libertarian Convention. We had fun. We had we oh. brought pictures. So some of the pictures in the background today come from come from the convention. We had fun time, didn't we? Oh, we sure did. And you know, speaking of that, I believe you got to meet our candidate for governor. Uh, Steve LePage. LePage, yes, he did. And he boy, is he a wonderful person, mm -hmm. very likable, and uh, very open to new ideas, too. Yeah. And I don't think he I have it He bought my book. Here. Oh, he did. <laughs> yes, okay, he did. well, he's open to new ideas. If yeah. he bought the book, you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, someone else who's going to run for governor, so I read in the papers, and I don't know where I put it here, but um, Russell Means, the mm -hmm. Indian activist, has accepted the nomination, libertarian nomination, for governor of New Mexico. Wonderful. And so he may be running uh, next year. I'm not uh, sure where I put that. I imagine, oh, it may be coming. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling. It is coming. Oh, here it is. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, I'll it? just hold it up, and which direction should I hold it? That o camera? Over okay. here in some kind of way. We got political today, but that's yeah. okay. But you know what? Um, we'll steer away from it in a moment. I, I know, but you know, um, Harry Brown, the, the presidential candidate, gave me a wonderful interview. Oh, we did. And yeah, we had we had a really nice time. There you go. Yeah, we had a really really nice time. Yeah, and uh, well, actually, you know, um, as I'll set this as down you now. know, uh, you know, Fiji fully informed jury association sort of they made me an ambassador. Oh. And so when I go and do my thing, I uh, I educate people. I give a workshop on uh, on fully informed jury. You see, and one of the things is that what you do and what I do is so close, it's not even connected. Because technically speaking, we both stand up for, we think we stand up for what is right. We like people to think and make up their own mind and take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not all that much difference. You know, I'm glad you brought up the juries and jury nullification. So that'll tie us, or tie me back for just a moment to the, uh, anti-terrorist bill that we talked about last time, and mm -hmm. I don't want to spend the whole time on that, but we were talking about a criminal trial, and this has new crimes it's created, where the citizen would be accused of materially aiding a terrorist organization, and you know, as I was reviewing it, it may not be a foreign terrorist organization either. There are, uh, Attorney General uh, has the power to declare domestic organizations that are right. entirely American yeah. to be domestic terrorist organizations. But if you're accused of materially aiding that organization, and it, let's say it was like the Palestinian Quakers and you sent blankets and food and medical supplies, and at your trial you'd want to say, well, this is only humanitarian aid. I'm just trying yeah. to do the right thing. And then the judge would try to stop you, of course, from saying anything like that. But this is the kind of law and its application in that instance, the juries would just chafe under. I mean, for a jury to hear that all they get to decide is, well, did the Secretary of State designate this organization to be terrorist? And did you materially aid it by sending a little donation or something? And that's it. 
If they find that, they're supposed to find you guilty. They're not going to like that. What disturbed me a whole lot now, I've never been able to talk about this. Uh, here I go. Uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan. Now, you're talking about a person, a, a man, a minister, that peacefully organized one million people. Yeah. And uh, the frame of mind the country is, uh, that wasn't the easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But here, he made them all of like mind. They had a common cause, and it was a wonderful thing he did. And then, of course, he was offered the money uh, for his people um, on a religious basis, from Muslim to Muslim, mm -hmm. to, to take care of his his church. And they want to chime for treason. My. And I found that not good because why? Why? Let me. See. I'm going to talk this out because I don't didn't know I was going to talk about that. Um, you know, we we give foreign aids and everything. We have a lot of problems in in United States. So for other countries, by religion, mm -hmm. to come forward and and try to help the American problem, yeah. I thought was wonderful. And um, but then to to say if you accept, I think it was six billion dollars. Mm -hmm. If you accept this, we will try you for treason. And I didn't understand that. Now, just for argument's sake, how would that tie into the anti-terrorism bill? Boy, it would, it would fit because the, um, the similarity is so striking here. Uh, it, it's just a little bit of a reversal, um, just a reverse flow. In the anti-terrorist bill, the American is sending aid to another country. And right. the American's going to get prosecuted. Well, here with Louis Farrakhan, he's an American, and he's accepting humanitarian aid from another country mm -hmm. or from individuals, and he's going to get prosecuted. They all go to you jail. Can, yeah, everybody goes to jail. Oh, isn't it wonderful? The police state, wonderful. Everybody goes to jail for everything. Everything's a crime. It's not just that we have a war on drugs and a war on sex and a war on, uh, you know, uh, private property and a war on hemp. Uh, you know, we got a war on everything. You know, we are, have come to the state where there's a war on everything. Now, now, when uh, in the last few months, as, as you know, you know, my house is in a sinkhole, and I'm still not organized. And today is uh, this is July already. Today is the time of this taping is the 16th of July, and I'm still not orga organized. I have one house in a sinkhole and one up on stills, and I can't live in either one of them. And my outlook on homeless changed tremendously mm. because. Um, I finally understand why people would prefer to live under a bridge yeah. other than, you know, the, you, you have to go here, you have to do this, you have to do this. And unfortunately, I had friends that gave me a hand. But the mental hassle of trying to um, meet the criteria of a responsible renter or anything at all after being a homeowner for 16 years, well, um, it, it was hard even to rent an apartment because I no longer live that criteria. And so being homeless is, is a hard thing. And back to what, you was, what we were saying here, so here come a group of people and said, here's some money, take care of your people. And then somebody yeah. else said, oh, I don't think so. Leave them where they're at because it's not <laughs> yeah. the way to do Leave this. Leave them homeless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave them broke. Leave them sick. You know, don't help anyone. It's... Um, it's very confusing, especially to a, to a foreigner. It's very con the English, English language by itself is, is really confusing. And the third article, I wrote two articles on the accessible on my web page. The third article, I was going to name it, excuse me, I didn't hear you the first time. Um, but then it got changed to something else. But a person tells you something and then that's what you know or what you hear. And five minutes later, it changes. And mm -hmm. I guess it's like your bill here. Mm -hmm. They must all heard something totally different before they signed it, huh? Yes. Uh, what they heard is, well, the anniversary's coming up. Mm -hmm. And we've got to do something. Mm -hmm. And it's the mentality of we should do something even if it's wrong. And you know, the odd thing is, you know, there's already lots of legislation on the books. Um, everything that anybody would do to blow up a federal building and kill people is already a crime many times over. Mm -hmm. And so, yet you pass even more, even more things. 
And so what you start to do is you start to get into the areas of punishing innocent conduct. I mean, it gets to the point where there's only so many crimes, right? Real crimes, crimes of aggression, crimes of hurting someone. And so when you're going to pass more and more laws, if you start to get in the millions, which we now have, actually, if you look two at million. the total laws, about two million, you know, some of these have to move out into the areas of punishing innocent conduct. Uh, I'll quote Anne Rand here for a moment, you know, the author, Atlas right. Shrugged. And she said that, uh, gov very uh, cryptic, but yet telling, she says, the government has no power over innocent men. It only has power over criminals. Yeah. So as it grows and as laws grow, it criminalizes more and more things to criminalize otherwise innocent conduct to make everyone a criminal. And that, uh, and that brings me back to an example here. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get around to talking about the changes in conspiracy with the anti-terrorists. Can you hold your thought there for a minute? I'll hold I just it. remembered something. Uh, if you remember, we did two shows with a man named Fred Markham uh, in the prison legal news. And of course, since we tape ahead of time, uh, sometimes the shows don't get aired in the order you know, that we mm -hmm. tape them. And um, I got some phone calls about Mark, um, Fred Markham. In essence, what turned out that um, he had evidently had embezzled some money from no. the legal person knows, which reflected not had nothing to do with our show because at that time he was still in management, and so we were not liable for him embezzling money um, at a later time. But the sad part was that the new that the new manager of the legal person knows didn't know that we had ever done this show, no. and so when when the friends called and they said, "Oh, I don't want to hear it." Uh, this man is a criminal, <laughs> and he embezzled oh. money, so they missed the whole point. So we're going to re-air um, the legal prison shows, and with an open mind, don't look at um, Fred Markham as as what? Well, don't don't look at, at him just as a fallen person, right. as the sinner. His information was yeah very good. You know, he's he's like so many of us, both saint and sinner. I mean, yeah. we've all got the good side and the dark side. And, you know, some of the work he was doing was very good. It was very good. But he's led a very hard life, and he was tempted. Yeah. And I think he admitted on the show that the reasons he had been in prison were basically petty thievery type things. That's right. He did. He did 30 years. You know, and so, and there could also be something a little deeper here. If he spent so much of his life in prison, he's even though he's institutionalized, he's institutionalized. Yeah. you knew yeah. where I was headed with that. Yeah. Even though it's a horrible experience, it, you get socialized to that, yeah. and there's a certain amount of irritation and uncertainty in being on the outside and being yeah. freer, a kind of anxiety yeah. that the institutionalized person gets so irritated over while some have even killed themselves. You know, the Shanksha Redemption made a very, the movie of Shanksha Redemption made a really, really good point at the man. I was thinking it of that. Couldn't do, it couldn't cope, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking of that very, very scene yeah, where the so. older man couldn't cope. Yeah, so I needed to work that in here. And, and so for, for Fred, there may be a variety of things going on here. And, well, I'll tell you one of my experiences. See, I worked in a prison a long time ago. And it was uh, Purdy, the women's prison. It was back in the middle 70s. It was the year that Elvis Presley died. And there was a lady, uh, and I, I think I can say her name. Uh, it was, uh, her last name was White. I can't remember her first name, but her, uh, Miss White had the misfortune to have been born. Uh, her father was exposed to radiation. He was a mm -hmm. scientist, nuclear scientist. He was exposed to radiation. So she was born with a hunchback and uh, with uh, deformed facial features. And so she was... Uh, you know, not pretty to look on, the opposite of that. But she had a brilliant mind. Mm -hmm. And she had a beautiful sister. And the family kind of doted on the beautiful sister and put her in the background. And she suffered a lot of emotional pain. And so what she did to get attention was she turned to crime. Mm -hmm. And I mean the kind of crimes where she would, like, break a store window and stand there. Oh, you my. Know. Or, and even more vicious, you know, take a razor blade and cut somebody and stand there. See, mm -hmm. and then eventually this gets you sent to prison. Yeah. See, and so the it, it's like a a cry sometimes for a kind of attention. Yeah. I think, and so maybe, you know, Fred Markham was actually not so interested in the money, but yeah. in just some way. Yeah. But he, to he get was back to a, 
regardless. Um, he, he, I liked him. He was a wonderful person. Well, he had a good spirit, and it's like, okay, you feel like about Fred Markham, like, okay, he embezzled this money today, but tomorrow, if he saw, you know, a beggar in the street, he'd give it away. He'd give it he away. Would, yeah. That's what I'm thinking. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, and I totally interrupted you. We, we, we got really excited. We it's went, okay. we and, went and here. I don't, I, I don't mean to be mistaken or to leave the wrong impression. I am not excusing embezzlement. I mean, it is against, uh, like, oh, wax yeah. political. It's against libertarian principles. You know, yeah. it's a, you know, aggression or stealing or fraud. These are all wrong. Uh, you know, you do what you promise to do, and you take what you know people have bargained to pay you, and you don't take what is right. not yours. Um, you know, Lysander Spooner said, justice is very simple. It is the science of what is mine and what is thine. And children learn this in their play, and they learn it by the time they're seven years old. And he said, if we had the right kind of jury system, a fully informed, randomly chosen jury, we would not need any written laws. Yeah. That pretty much we would know to do right. Yeah. And it would only be the rare exceptional case where a jury would be called upon to judge another fellow citizen. Because without laws, uh, without written laws, and without excessive government, he says, you just don't have crime. Yeah. You know, you may have people that make mistakes and harm themselves, drugs or alcohol, whatever, but that's not a crime. Yeah. I mean, they're harming themselves. You know, if they run amok and harm somebody else, well then, yes, it is a crime. But if they're just harming themselves, it's not a crime, and uh, government does more harm than good by making things illegal, creating a black market, yeah. creating criminal syndicates, et cetera. I, I won't, I kind of digressing. I'll get back to the anti-terrorist bill because there was just a couple things that I, I didn't cover last time that I would like to, uh, with, uh, if, we can, if we can go into it. Yeah, uh, you see, normally I can get you right back to where you was, mm -hmm. and I'm sitting here trying to think because you got really excited and then I went off to Fred Markham. Yeah, away. well, and I don't we know how to really know. went with Fred there for a while, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, so. Um, this bill changes federal conspiracy law. That's what it was, yeah. First, I'll define my terms. Conspiracy, what is conspiracy? Conspiracy is conversation and an agreement. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Um, it, kind of interesting, we'll do a little jiu-jitsu here. Very often establishment critics of patriots and libertarians and people who study politics and you know, people who say, well, there's wrongdoing going on and there's a government conspiracy. Well, people who say that a government conspiracy is responsible for, say, the Oklahoma City bombing, and that's what I say, they, we get um, stigmatized as conspiracy theorists, conspiracy nuts. Interesting how when it's a person like me talking about conspiracy, I'm some sort of a nut. But yet, if you read the federal code, the federal government believes in conspiracy. They have conspiracy sections. They yeah. have outlawed conspiracy. You wouldn't outlaw something that doesn't exist. Well, just like aliens, you cannot, uh, aliens as of space, you know, space. Yes, you know, you can be picked up, quarantined, and held without trial for up to a year if you communicate with an alien. But <laughs> it doesn't exist. But Project Blue Book says it was all weather balloons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah same principle. Well, conspiracy is just an agreement, just a conversation and an agreement. But federal law before this, before the Anti-Terrorist Act of 1996, and it's public law 104-132 again, before that required an overt act. Two people, or three, or more, agree to do something that's a crime. Just the conversation agreement is not enough. They have to do one overt act. Now, overt act can be very small. It can be going out and buying a screwdriver so that we can you know, take the screws out of the door and get in somewhere. Mm -hmm. It can be something very small. It, the overt act does not have to be criminal. It can just be one little step in the direction of the conspiracy to mm -hmm. further the conspiracy. This abolishes that requirement if the conspiracy is uh, a terrorist conspiracy or, an exp or a conspiracy involving explosives. No overt act requirement. Just conversation alone is enough. Now, the, average American here watching this out in TV land, they're going to say, well, it doesn't affect me much. Oh, no? Yeah, but it does. How many times on April 15th, or getting close to it, <laughs> when you finally begin wrestling with those taxes, and oh, what a bill, have yeah. you said to a friend or another family member, yeah. oh, uh, boy, I'd like to just take that infernal revenue service and blow it up. And then yeah. your friend or your brother or mother or the son or daughter, they say, me, me too. too. Yes, yeah. exactly. Well, guess what? 
Yeah. You're just now a to felon. Jail, Tom. <laughs> uh, and, you know, now we have said this in jest. Yeah. Now, everything we say is under the First Amendment, right? Right? Uh, yeah. So we're all, we're saying this for First Amendment purposes. Yeah. There's no agreement here yeah, to no, blow anything up. No agreement, Tom. Okay, so it does away with the That's overt act horrible. requirement, making it easier to prove and making conspiracy more dangerous, making, you know, basically that's, at any given time, maybe a couple million that's, people that's are guilty. A, that's a horrible. It's, even, it's almost funny. Yeah, it is almost funny. Now, the second thing it has done is it has also changed the penalty. The penalty was for conspiracy alone, not mm -hmm. actually doing it. Conspiracy alone was five years. Mm -hmm. Now it is 20 years. Hey, more, more slave Quadruple. labor in America. <laughs> more slave labor in America. And millions could be, could be subject to it. Yeah. And so in some ways, when you have, land, and I'll use Claire Wolf's term, landmine legislation like this, yeah. it is a matter somewhat of luck. Whether you are entangled in the American gulag and disappear for 20 years, or whether you just get to lead the normal, say, middle class, upstanding citizen life. It's a matter of luck. Your actual activities and motives and actions and words may not be any different than the poor person that went off to that Google. Yeah, but, but you know, I, what I found uh, here is actually um, we, have an, we have some upcoming shows on remote viewing and in there it's sort of um, part of the conversation had went like that where the average person is so set in a routine um, they get up and they have their coffee and they go to work and they watch maybe Nightline. Usually that's so late that uh, current affairs is mm. not in their reality and so on and so on. And it's sad how many people just don't care. Well, you know, I had this very conversation with Pat Michael, um, I believe it was just yesterday, and we were trying to sort it out. Is it that people don't care? Or they are just so convinced that nothing they do can make a difference. Oh, that's an interesting point. She said, I, th I think, and she was giving me the voting statistic, how in this country, 60% or more do not vote. The majority doesn't vote. I mean, it may well, even be as high as two-thirds. Well, after what vote. happened, uh, we lucky if anybody votes. <laughs> yes, I know. After Florida, where it looked like, uh, you just my take on it is, you know, both sides were trying to rig it, and, you know, uh -huh. one side just was better or got the Supreme Court behind them uh, and got their rig job um, pulled off, you know, got their firstest with the mostest mm -hmm. on that. And she says, you know, we may be coming to a place where two-thirds, maybe already two-thirds, and she says, well, I'm talking a presidential election, two-thirds aren't voting. Uh, yeah. If you have another kind of election that's not nearly as high profile, it might be way more than that. Now, in some countries, I have read, and Australia is one of them, I've read that uh, not voting is a crime. I mean, they are going to legitimize that system by getting the voters to vote. Mm -hmm. Even if the voters don't like any of the choices and don't want to vote, there was even a man, and I saw it, I believe, in the spotlight. Uh, the uh, populist newspaper from Washington, D.C. had the story of this man, I forget his name, and he was thrown in prison because he took out an ad in the newspaper and said, I'm urging my fellow citizens not to vote. Mm -hmm. These parties, and I can't remember how many they have, two or three major ones, these parties are, are bad. And no matter who gets in, you know, no matter who you vote for, the government always gets in, kind of thing. Hey, I have an idea. We can, We're always we, going on the same we can take those ballots and send them to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll all get and they'll voted. All, oops, you know, uh, maybe every square will get pushed. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, there's other ways to monkey wrench a system. You could overdo it. Vote for everybody. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, what you I vote mean. for all the candidates if you can, you know, yeah. every last one of them. Yeah. So this man got put in prison because he took out that ad and he's threatening the political establishment. Well, why can you put somebody in prison for free speech, you know? Well, it's because they don't have a First Amendment, see? Mm -hmm. Now, people get put in prison here for free speech, but the government's got to work a lot harder at yeah. it, or a little bit harder. Uh, there, I mean, he just took out his ad and, and you know, his, uh, his jury, again, he had a jury, but what are they told? I mean, they're told you have to convict yeah. because you know, the judge is not telling them that they have the power to do the right thing. They have the power to vote their conscience. And of course that brings us to, you know, what can people do? Why are people uh, feeling like they can't make a difference? Well, even if there wasn't any fraud, most people figure, well, I'm one vote out of a million or one vote out of 10,000 or one vote out of 1,000. And I don't know if there's going to be fraud or not. I mean, they've got these problems with the count, is it honest? Uh, the impact, does it really have any? And then with ballot box voting for candidates, there's often very little real reflection, you know. Mm -hmm. But the jury vote's quite different. 
in all three areas. I think we covered this before. Uh -huh, yeah, but uh, something else we covered High before, impact. Uh, before, long before this happened, we mentioned vote scam on, oh, we on did. the shows that we did. Oh, the Collier Remember brothers. Remember that? Yeah, J mm -hmm. uh, James and Ken Collier. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that brings me up something else that Ken Collier did in a moment. Yes, the Collier brothers, uh, they ran a campaign against, uh, I believe it was Claude Pepper, I think, in Florida a long time ago in the early 70s. And they were doing it partly for the political experience. They were journalists, and they just wanted to write about what it's like to run a political campaign. One brother ran, and the other one was the campaign manager. And I can't remember who was who. And they did some fun things. You know, They discovered that Claude Pepper, he was a Democrat that had been in Congress forever and was a very powerful committee uh, chairman. And they discovered that he had ties to all these banks and that some of these banks had been ripping off uh, poor people, you know, uh, exorbitant mortgages in the poor part of town, and then, you know, raking obscene profits off of them. And then the garbage service in the poor part of town, this is Miami, Dade County, was so terribly poor and there was no money for services, but yet the part of town where the banks were was just upper crust and lush and everything. So the Collier brothers got a dump truck. And they ran around early one morning, and they got all this garbage from poor sections. <laughs> and they went to the bank <laughs> and dumped a mountain of garbage in front of the bank, you know. And then we might not want to hit so hard. Oh, I don't know. Mike's picking yeah. us up on it. And so they they did things like that, fun things during their campaign, and took photos of that and mm. said, you know, we need to clean up the garbage, you know, here, and it's time to vote for a change and all that. Well, they had fun. Then on the night of the election, they wanted to see well who wins. They figured Claude Pepper would win. But, uh, and they ran as Democrats, so they're looking at the primary election. And so they couldn't, they were watching the returns come in, and the winner is declared, I mean, almost immediately. I mean, the polls haven't even closed yet. Yeah. So they go down to the news station and say, hold it, polls, polls haven't closed. How can you declare a winner? I mean, you got less than 10% of the votes counted here. They said, oh, we have these exit pollers. So they said, well, who are they? We want to talk to them. Well, uh, uh, we can't give you their names. So that led them to investigate how is it actually right. counted. And then they finally got to talk to some election workers who right. says, oh, hey, the election's decided ahead of time. Yeah. The numbers are decided ahead of time. These voting machines were actually placebos. At that time, it was these machines. You mm -hmm. pull levers, the wheels spin, and you know, some of them you pull a lever and it spins and, and you know, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And others you pull levers and it will finally roll up numbers, you know, the guy that's supposed to win. Yeah. And we even put the numbers in the back. Yeah. At the end of the day, the back's taken off and the numbers are there for the yeah. winner. The, the name of the book is called, uh, to refresh your memory, it's called Vote Scam by... Vote Scam, The Stealing of America by James and Ken Collier. Right, yeah, and, and we had um, introduced you to that book, what, almost two years ago. Yes, it's been, uh, it's yeah. been a little while It was anyway. long before the election. I, yeah, I it was before the election, that, and yeah. then, of course, this election comes mm -hmm. along and just about proves everything they yeah. said in the book. Um, well, you know, the vote scam thing got me thinking, and, and it may have a lot of people thinking, you know, I'm not watching it being counted. And as we move into computerized vote counting, it'll be impossible for anybody to watch. In the old days, you know, you go to the courthouse and watch paper ballots being mm -hmm. counted, and then you can have a recount because you've got these physical things to recount. With computer voting, I mean, boy, it's anybody's guess how that could ever even be recounted, and you can't really watch it being counted. So what would you encourage people to do about that? I, I, I mean, like earlier we said, half the people, most of the people don't want to, probably don't even want to go vote anymore. I would encourage them to still register to vote and go vote, not because the ballot box vote is so important, although in, in a certain rare instance it might be, but because that's how you get on the rolls to be jurors. Back to the jury, back to the jury. That's where your vote really counts, and it counts heavily in three ways. The impact, okay, in a ballot box vote, thousands of votes, millions of votes, Bush or Gore, is there really a difference? People don't know if there's going to be an impact. But when you're on that jury judging another human being, I mean, you could either send somebody to prison for years or have them executed or free them like a bird. The impact is tremendous. And it's more than just that one person. Very often there's principles involved, such as uh, Steve and Michelle Cubby's uh, marijuana growing case in California, which was just resolved in their favor. They got uh, an 11 to 1 verdict for acquittal. It was a hung jury, That's but still the numbers came down 11 to 1. And what Steve Cubby was doing is he was growing the marijuana. He has cancer, pancreas cancer, or, or adrenal cancer. And uh, he's growing the marijuana as medicine, and he was square within the four corners of Proposition 215, which he helped pass. So All he was right. square within the boundary of the law, and he was rated anyway. Yeah. And, you know, it comes, who can say, you know, 
the police are not following the law. The prosecutors are not following the law. The attorney general said, oh, I can't have anything to do with it. It's a local matter. I'm not going to give even any interpretations of this law that the voters passed. It was only the jury that could save him. See? And the impact of that verdict, 11 to 1 for an acquittal, and the government will not retry it, is that 215 is good law. Proposition 215 yeah. is good law. And other people, so you'll have impact beyond the cubbies. Other people who are sick can grow medical marijuana. It, it's a stepping stone in that direction. You know, you have a real impact. Okay, so the impact's very obvious to people, uh, or it's going to get obvious if we keep talking about this. And then there's the count. You're one out of 12 if it's a felony criminal case, or maybe one out of six if it's a misdemeanor. Sometimes there's these six-person juries. There's even odd numbers sometimes in civil cases, like nine and so forth. Uh, but still, you know how it's counted. I mean, you're right there. I mean, there's no question. If that's not your verdict, well, you can stand up and, you know, lower heaven and raise hell about it. So the count is, is not something that's going to be counted far away by some computer program. And then number three, the reflection. You know, when it's a ballot box vote, and here's, uh, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, and how often do you think about them? There's a sound bite on TV or something. A court case, if you're a juror, you live with that case. Hours, days, weeks. After, after. You thought about it. Yeah, after we did the, for, uh, for your information, on the, the juror workshop that we do, I mean, people came to my house, and they were really tore up about things that, had happened to him while he was on the jury, and when they viewed the program, they said, oh, wow, uh, if had I only known that. Mm -hmm. And they really beat themselves up, you know. Now, now back to this here for a minute. Now, it, it really takes, uh, it, when I keep pointing here, mm -hmm. in case you don't know what we're talking about, uh, today we're talking about all kinds of things, and one of them is uh, the anti-terrorism bill uh, that got passed in 1996. The anti-terrorism bill lives so limits the freedoms of the average citizens that mm -hmm. it's, it's... Well, yeah, it limits your free speech. Yeah. I mean, that could be construed as materially aiding. Right. Um, if you are an alien, wow, does it ever do something to your jury trial rights? We were talking about that. Mm -hmm. There's this new alien removal court that yeah. is a bench trial only, judge only, no jury. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the reasons are pretty obvious. I mean, in the bill, the reasons are part of the evidence against you is going to be this classified information. Right. And classified means, you know, government agents only uh, on this need-to-know basis. And if you have to present that evidence in front of a jury, well, then the jury's got to know about it. Yeah. Uh, even if they're sworn to secrecy afterwards, why, they're ordinary citizens, and some information that's classified might not strike citizens the same way that it strikes government agents. I mean, mm -hmm. the government agents think there's a real need to classify this, yeah. keep it secret. Citizens might think different. This is the kind of thing that should be made public above all others. A good example would be if there is evidence for UFOs, solid evidence that the government has, mm -hmm. and many ex-military people will tell you, and they're taking a risk, too, to tell us. And I think you've had some of them on I've the show. I've known a lot of them. <laughs> uh, and like Robert Dean, uh, they'll say, you know, we've seen the things moving. We've got them on camera. We've, you know, we've even, mm -hmm. uh, some of them have crashed and we've taken a good look at their technology. This kind of thing. Well, it's highly classified. Yeah, and yet the average citizen is going to say if there's alien technology that is beyond something like the internal combustion engine, which yeah. pollutes the environment and we're still driving 100 year old technology. Something strange about that. Yeah. We're relegated to that, and the government is starting to explore a a alien, you know, free energy, anti gravity type technology. Yeah. Share the wealth, that's what the jury would say. Yeah, now, see, but now Robert Dean, he ended up, he opened, uh, he was the opening speaker of the, what is, what is it called, the Metro D? Oh, um, um, uh, he opened the MC, the. the uh, yeah, the, the MC, yeah, when yeah. they opened the um, UFO uh, Museum in Japan. Oh. Yes, he was. So he did get some acknowledgement. Um, I ha we have to acknowledge something else. A few days ago, four firefighters got killed in the line of duty in eastern Washington in the Cleallum area. And uh, one of the firefighters, his name was Tom Graven, and he is our friend Kanashiba-shan's nephew. And so we all want to um, 
maybe we can send a little love and light to uh, to to Kanashiba Shan. Um, I have never seen her upset like that in 20 years. Um, her outlook on death is somewhat like mine, and sometimes we are death walkers. We help people, but this one shook her up really bad because it took, you know, what led up to that. So we need to acknowledge that um, and ask that Kanashiba Shan will be sent a little extra energy here. Yeah. Because she needs to be set free from the the shock of the death and the way they it die too. Away. This would be a yeah. pretty painful way to die. Yeah. So so I needed to to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell blank again. Um, you oh, pick it up. Well, you know, from the fire, I, I'll say this. It, you know, sometimes it's inconceivable to think that you know fire when you think we've all touched a hot stove at one time or another or got a flame just on a finger or something and wow the reaction i mean that really lets you know what pain is about yeah. and to think that fire at one time was a mode of execution oh i mean my it's God. just so yeah. horrible to think of and i remember when uh, i was talking with my chiropractor alan jones in wenatchee about these uh, issues and specifically the oklahoma city uh, bombing and, um, you know, I was telling him about the physics mm -hmm. and the impossibility of the fertilizer truck. And he says, but, but I just can't get past the confession. I mean, Timothy McVeigh confessed. What about this confession? And I says, well, Dr. Jones, uh, hundreds of years ago, there were thousands and thousands of people burned at the stake as witches. Based on their confessions. You took the words out of my mouth. And they all confessed. Yeah. So they were all witches, right? He drew a blank and he blinked, and then he had this nervous laughter. And he says, "Well, he says they were they were tortured into those confessions, and uh, and I think we've progressed a little since then." I says, "Words to this effect." I may not give my quote exactly right. I says, "We haven't progressed one inch." Yeah. We are still as brutal and barbaric. If anything, what we've done is we've refined torture to a new level, and it's called mind control. Uh, and I said that is where the Timothy McVeigh story really, uh, where the truth in it yeah. really lies. We're going to be, in one of the upcoming shows, uh, we're going to talk about our series on the Timothy McVeigh story like that. But the other thing is, um, oh, I'm very disoriented today. I want to say something about that from what I understand. Harp has been turned up on the 15th of uh, July, and something interferes with my line of thinking. I'm right there, and then I lose it. And uh, you've been scattered all day, too, haven't you? Well, I've been very tired because I didn't get much sleep last night. What I've been experiencing, and, and uh, it's been quite a bit of back pain, because I had a serious back injury years ago, which for many years didn't really bother me much, and now it is coming to get me, probably old age, or uh, or maybe it's that uh, I haven't nursed it either, you know. So um, so I've noticed that, uh, and and Harp, you've probably mentioned Harp on the program before. Should we do a little explanation of what we mean by Harp? You know, angels don't play this Harp. Oh yeah, uh, most most of the most of the viewers know uh, what Harp is, uh, but you, good idea. We'll do that again. Harp is a uh, project in um, in Alaska that was designed for a couple things. I think um, it, it is Harp stands for a High Auroral Research Program. Uh -huh. The Hybrid idea concept. is to have many massive power generators generating, and they hope to at one time in the future, and they may be there now, generate a billion watts of power and have radio towers in an array to send large amounts of radio waves at high frequency out into the ionosphere, which is a level of the atmosphere that's about 600 miles out. And it is a charged, it has a charge to it. They intend to bounce the uh, high frequency radio waves off that ionosphere and because it's so far out they can actually bounce them all the way around to the other side of the world yeah and when they come back they will be the ionosphere will change them in the bounce or in the reflection to extremely low frequency low frequencies mm -hmm. and the low frequency has a penetrating quality it will penetrate under the ocean so they can see submarines mm -hmm. into the ground so they can see underground bases and tunnels 
Oh, and trees in eastern Washington. Yeah, and, and that's right. Well, that was just uh, ordinary <laughs> optics from, uh, from uh, yeah, satellite. Yeah, I, I know. I'm yeah, sorry. but that was kind of cute there. And so uh, now, so it's the military is very interested in it. Congress hasn't done much oversight. The dangerous thing about it, and the information I'm getting is from Dr. Nick Begich, who wrote the book Angels. He wrote the book Angels Spray Dead Hop. Don't play this harp, mm -hmm. uh, is that the extremely low frequency often operates at the same frequency as human thought. Because human thought right. has a certain frequency. It's like about 30 hertz. And this extremely low frequency uh, radio waves operates at that. Yeah, so really the potential to disrupt human thought yeah, sure is, is extreme. Today. Mm -hmm. And because this uh, of the power and the uh, way they can use the ionosphere as a mirror, they can get extremely wide bands of this low frequency radio waves. So they could cover perhaps large sections of the country or a country yeah. or parts of a continent. So they could do this, disrupt people on a mass scale. Yeah. Uh, and what exactly it would do, I'm not sure. Whether it just leads to fuzzy thinking or illness or crazy behavior, maybe suicidal, maybe homicidal behavior. Oh, like I don't that. know. It could do all of that. And you mentioned there was a, con a, a bird that we saw just outside the door. That's right. Outside the studio, a yellow finch. Um, it was just dead. And, and I, I thought, uh, psychically, as an empath, I looked at it, and his eardrums had blown. That's what killed him. Gee. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those, one of those days. And a, a bird, now I'm not uh, a bird person. I don't know that much about birds. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm assuming that birds, I know their eyesight's better, but many of their senses are more developed, more highly refined, more highly attuned than human beings. I'm not a bird person either, but um, I would think that they are civil sensitive, and that was one dead bird. Yeah. It was not good. It was a beautiful little bird, a beautiful green. It almost looked like a canary, but yeah. it was a yellow finch. Yeah, mm -hmm. just a beautiful bird. The eyesight I can attest to, because birds follow me when I'm in my tractor, because I'm turning up field mines. Mm -hmm. And you know, they'll be way up. And I have no idea what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And something off to my right or to my left, 100, 200 feet or something, whoosh, they'll swoop down and get. And they've got something. They got mm -hmm. a field mouse. Or so every once in a while, they'll it's get a snake. It's amazing, huh? It's amazing. Their eyesight is just mm -hmm. tremendous. And so you know, it makes you wonder. Um, their eyesight is so good. You know, we, we humans, we see in color. But you wonder what we would see if we had an eagle's eye. Are there more colors than we're aware of? Uh, are there shades that we don't know? Mm -hmm. there, the uh, eagle or hawks, uh, these are ha hawks and crows. I'll, I'll give what they are. Um, they definitely have a motion detection that I don't have. You know, I'm closer to what they're seeing mm -hmm. than they are. And they see it and I don't. And then when they come up, why something's wiggling in their, in their claws. If I was to offer you a vacation today, Right now, where would you go? I'm not sure, but I'd be tempted to look into uh, John of God in uh, Brazil. I'm trying to think where he is, Abadiania. He's the Catholic priest of the house of uh, St. Dom Inacio, who has uh, great faith healing powers, mm -hmm. because I would sure like to get some relief from my crushed vertebrae in my back. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the orthopedic doctors will tell you that these bones of vertebrae, when they're crushed, they don't regrow. You know, that's in their physics, in their science. I'm sure they are correct as far as they know. I'm not convinced that that is the uh, sum total of all medical knowledge or even all spiritual knowledge by any means. Uh, I'm open to the possibility of miracles. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would be a vacation that I would get to see in other country. And, uh, you know, I don't speak Portuguese. That's what they speak there. I guess I'd have to brush up on it. There's mm -hmm. probably a few English speakers. But when you go there to the house of St. Uh, Dom Inacio, what you do is you stay there for a while. Mm -hmm. It's not an instantaneous thing. You stay, you meditate, they have gardens. Um, John of God comes. He looks in at you, looks into your soul, touches you, and then kind of gives you a prediction as to what's going to happen with you. Mm -hmm. And the healings are not always instantaneous. Usually they're not. But some people do get healed. And so I believe it's possible for a crushed vertebrae to regrow to its original mm -hmm. shape. That would certainly help with my problem. Uh, greater and more wonderful things have happened there. You know? yeah. And you know, he's, he's following uh, in the footsteps of the man from Galilee, you know, when you read about the wonderful miracles in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And then where Jesus says, the things that I do, 
these things. He's talking to his disciples. Yeah. The things that I do, these things will you do and greater. Boy, I don't have the faith to, mm -hmm. to go that far. But when you think of, of uh, the stories of Jesus that he raised the dead, Mm -hmm. uh, then you th and you think he says these things you will do and greater. But isn't it? Uh, I'm really glad I asked you that question uh, because it it gives the uh, the scale of you as a person, as a, a spell checker, a citation checker. Everything has to be explained and checked and verified and verified. <laughs> and as we round it out, and here we talk about miracles, and what that shows me that we can be very logical, very definite. Um, we can believe what it is that we feel that is right and at the same token go with the flow and mm. give credit where it's due. That's great. Well, not everything can be explained. You know, yeah. it just can't. And uh, you know, in the law, you can look up a citation and everything, but even in the law, sometimes you can't fully explain mm -hmm. things. You know, I, I don't know if I fully explained the mindset of the men and, and women who passed the anti-terrorist bill. Uh, I don't fully understand it. I don't think there's anything that, it either. I don't think there's anything that could have gotten me to sign my name to this or vote for it. Yeah. However, you know, looking at it through their eyes, they also either don't have my suspicions mm -hmm. that Fine. the government itself blew this building up, or if they have my suspicions, they know something that has filled them so much with fear. With fear. That yeah. they will not. Uh, let their mind run that direction too far. And on that cue, we have to, we have to run for today. I appreciate you visiting with uh, Tom and me again. Next time we're going to have, we're going to ask um, Mr. Jared to come along. Oh, Jeff Jared, uh, Jeff Jared. the Senate yeah, candidate. He, he went on a trip to um, India and he said he had wonderful pictures. He's going to bring them. Give my regards to your mother. We wish your father well and we're going to sign off for today. and. He thanks for coming and have a really good harvest. Well, I will. Um, you know, am I, I'm slipping something here. I held up Russell Means' picture. I, we didn't explain who Russell Means is, did we? No, we didn't, but we're at the end of the show, so that means we have to do another one at a later time. American Indian okay. Movement Leader okay. Okay. and Actor. Oh, how appropriate with the opening shot. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, come see us next week.